So we're switching gears a bit here. Band theory. So molecular orbital theory, which we have talked about, um, led to the development of band theory, which is a more comprehensive model for the metallic and covalent solids. So remember with molecular orbital theory, the, the orbitals are delocalized over the entire molecule instead of just being localized between the two atoms. And that explained a lot of things that um, valence bond theory and Lewis theory couldn't explain. So in these um, metallic and covalent solids, the atomic orbitals of the atoms are combined and delocalized over the entire crystal. When the atoms combine and form these molecular orbitals, there are lower energy bonding orbitals and higher energy anti-bonding orbitals. Remember this stuff? This is where we had the two, two orbital diagrams and then we combined them and there was pi star and sigma star and all the little boxes. So the lower energy bonding orbitals are occupied, the anti-bonding orbitals are empty. As the number of atoms increases, the energy difference between the levels becomes negligible. The number of atoms in a particular lump of this solid, because they all combine together. And as they combine together, the difference between antibonding and bonding in energy becomes less and less and less. So here's lithium. Lithium has a, a valence electron in this one orbital. If we combine two lithium atoms, their, their orbitals combine and form an, a bonding orbital and a non-bonding orbital. There's two electrons. Those two electrons will go into the bonding orbital and the antibonding will be empty. If we combine three, we're going to end up with three. If we combine four lithium atoms, we end up with four different orbitals here. Again, it's always the lower energy orbitals, which are going to be the bonding orbitals, that will be full. The antibonding will be empty. But as we combine more and more and more and delocalize over the entire structure, the difference in energy between the antibonding and the bonding becomes lower and lower and lower. The empty orbitals are called the conduction band. The occupied orbitals are called the valence band. This is where the valence electrons are. The conduction band is the antibonding orbitals that are empty. Any questions yet? Electrons become mobile, able to move across the solid when they move from the valence band, the highest occupied molecular orbitals, into the conduction band, the empty antibonding orbitals. Whether they can move into that band or not depends on the gap between those two bands, the conduction band and the valence band. In metals, there is no gap. There's no gap at all. And so the electrons can move into the conduction band. It's almost like um, I kind of envision it as this is being a traffic jam, and this is um, like the shoulder. And there's nobody on the shoulder. And so if you can just jump over here into the shoulder, you can just zoom along and go anywhere, right? Whereas everybody else is stuck here. So these electrons are not mobile, but the electrons that get into these empty orbitals can move from one to the next atom and, and conduct electricity. Metals are good electrical conductors because the electrons can move into that conduction pan band and move across the surface, well, not the surface, but they can move through the metal, and that's how it conducts electricity. Thermal conductivity um, 
happens because those mobile electrons in the conduction band are able to quickly transport thermal energy throughout the crystal lattice. Now what does that mean? Thermal conductivity as opposed to electrical conductivity. That's conducting heat. Why do we make our pans that we use on the stove out of metal? Because we want the heat from the burner to be conducted through the metal to the food inside. We want heat conduction, thermal conductivity. How does thermal conductivity happen? It happens faster in metals because those electrons that are mobile can carry that thermal energy from one part of the metal to the other. In a substance where the electrons are not free to move, where no particles are free to move, thermal conduction is much slower. So here we have a conductor, such as a metal. We've got a valence band, we've got the conduction band. There's no energy gap. The electrons can just move over here, and then they're in the conduction band, and they can move around. So there's no, no energy gap at all. In a semiconductor, there's a small energy gap. So there's limited conductivity. Some electrons can get up here if they have enough energy to get into the conduction band. The cool thing about semiconductors is that you can change their conductivity by applying pressure to them, by uh, changing the temperature, by applying an electric voltage to them, and this is what makes them so useful in um, computers. In an insulator, there's a large energy gap, and electrons just cannot get into the conduction band. So an insulator will not conduct electricity, and it will not conduct heat very well. Any questions yet? We can also ad adjust the conductivity of semiconductors by doping it, adding small amounts of a different substance called a dopant. So an n-type semiconductor contains additional electrons in the conduction band. So if we take silicon, which is a group 4A element, how many valence electrons does silicon have? This is a simple question. Four, thank you. And so we take silicon, and all those silicon atoms have four valence electrons. All those valence electrons are hanging out in the valence band. There's a small energy gap to the conduction band. If we throw some phosphorus atoms in there, phosphorus atoms have five valence electrons. Those extra electrons are going to have to be in the conduction band because there's not enough space for them in the valence band. So we have additional electrons in the conduction band because the valence band is full. And so those electrons are mobile and conduct electrical charge. So we can make a semiconductor more conductive by throwing in um, a doping agent such as phosphorus in silicon to increase the number of electrons. A p-type semiconductor has electron holes in the valence band. Instead of having extra electrons, it's short some electrons. So if we take silicon again with four valence electrons and we dope it with gallium, which has three valence electrons, then we have empty molecular orbitals in the valence band. And this allows for conduction also because electrons in the valence band can move from hole to hole. So it creates holes in the valence band, and the electrons can move within the valence band. Silicon chips have millions of these p-n junctions. So these are tiny areas that are p-type on one side and n-type on the other side. And these can act as diodes or amplifiers, and this is the basis of computer technology. Sure, if you're interested in computers, you probably um, are aware of some of this, but computers come down to chemistry. <laughs>